We welcome you back. And it's always great to uh, say hello to Michael Bratton from the SC or that SEC podcast. I want to make sure I get that right. There's a difference between the SEC podcast and yes. that this SEC is, uh, podcast. And I'm going I'm to ask Michael what the difference is. Michael, good afternoon. <laughs> hey, Paul, you'll get it eventually. But uh, as always, it's, it's always an honor to come on the show and talk with you. So uh, b- before I go, I get too deep, I, I, I was reminded of a conversation we had. I think it was media days, but we talked to you so often. Could be could have been some other time where everyone was extolling the virtue and the praise of the University of Kentucky. And you, you dropped a bomb on us and that bomb suddenly uh, looks pretty smart. Tell us about your prediction that Kentucky uh, would end up fifth in the SEC East. Yeah, whenever you have me on, Paul, particularly at media days, as everybody knows, you get guest after guest after guest. So you only got so much time to make a point. You get you were kind enough to give me a couple minutes. But, yeah, I, I said Kentucky would be fifth in the East. I, I got laughed by a, a lot of people up there in Kentucky, including some of the uh, people on staff there that uh, have been sending me DMs ever since. And they've not apologized, but should Kentucky lose to Georgia like we anticipate, should Florida beat Vanderbilt, which also we anticipate. Kentucky is going to finish fifth in the SEC, as I told you they would at SEC Media Day. So it's been a good week for me in that regard. Michael, what did you know that the rest of us didn't? Well, a lot of, I mean, clearly I just got lucky, Paul. I mean, it's not like I have some crystal ball here, but just looking at the schedule, I thought they'd lose to Florida. I thought they'd lose to Tennessee. thought they'd lose to Georgia right there is three SEC losses. Ole Miss, Mississippi State split those two. There's you another one. I never, who in their right mind would have seen Vanderbilt beating Kentucky, but that subs out for that Florida loss. And just Kentucky is, I never bought into the Will Levis hype. He's a great college player. I'm not, it's it's ridiculous to say that he's uh, going to be the number one NFL draft selection as many have predicted. And just the, the offensive line, Paul, they, that's what Kentucky's known for. I never in my wildest dreams would imagine Kentucky's offensive line as bad as it is right now, but losing both tackles in their center, I knew they would struggle a little bit. And man, I, like I said, not even I saw how poor they'd be this season. Michael Braden with us from that SEC podcast. Michael, tell us what's going on with the Auburn coaching search or what, or what you think is going on. Yeah, it's interesting, Paul, hearing the same thing everybody else is, Lane Kiffin, that's the name everyone circled on. And uh, what's interesting, Paul, that uh, even people that I've heard from at Ole Miss now in the last week or so are a little bit more concerned that he could jump ship to Auburn. But, you know, Paul, you know how these things work. All A year from now, all we heard was Lincoln Riley to LSU. And... At the last minute, of course, that didn't happen. So the only thing I'm convinced of, Paul, is Lane Kiffin is going to get a big, fat raise this offseason. I think that's more than anything what's being done behind the scenes. If I'm Lane Kiffin, Paul, I'm not taking that job. I'm waiting it out to see what happens first. Nick Saban retires, get that Alabama job, or Steve Sarkeesian's Texas program implodes, or Texas A&M's wise enough and fires Jimbo Fisher like they should have done about a month ago. Of those three jobs, I think Lane Kiffin wins a national championship at Alabama, Texas, or Texas A&M. I'd hold out for one of those three. Well, those are three amazing jobs. Since I don't think Alabama's opening any time in the next couple of years, and Texas could, A&M is the the story, though, that uh, none of us can quite figure out. Uh, You've been consistent on Jimbo Fisher. You haven't lollygagged around with uh, he's this or he's that. So what, what do you hear? Uh, and has that appetite out there gotten any uh, m- more voracious to uh, just write a big check and say enough's enough? Well, I believe last time I was on your show, Paul, I said the best win Jimbo's going to get this year is a four-point loss to Alabama, and they haven't won a game since. So that's holding true. I don't have confidence in them to beat UMass. I know they're a 33-point favorite. They will win that game, but I don't have confidence in them to get it done. I think uh, provided they lose to UMass, which, again, would be a historic upset uh, of a season of upsets, you've got to fire him immediately. And I think they'll finally wise up and, and get that done. But at the same time, Paul, you listen to what this guy has to say about his offense and it not adapting, and whoever they bring in, they're going to run the same system. What motivates him to make a change it sure as heck isn't going to be ross bjork 
<laughs> telling him what to do down there. He's got a king's ransom waiting for him, whether he wins every game remaining on his contract or loses every game remaining on his contract. I don't think Jimbo Fisher is uh, going to adapt that offense anytime soon, and, and we'll be sitting here in 12 months saying the same thing over and over and over. What's interesting, Michael, about the, the A&M situation, sometimes at, at a point like this, you, you'll hear a statement from the school, not believable, but you'll hear one, saying that you know, he's our coach, uh, he's not going anywhere, we have faith in him. Are you hearing anyth anything from A&M officials? No, absolutely not. But the, the only thing we're hearing is, whether, you know, they can't afford the buyout, which I don't believe for a second, because the longer this goes on, the more detriment it does to their program, Paul. I, I don't wish ill will on A and M. This is not A and M's a great place to play. They're loaded with talent, but we'll find out here come early December, Paul, when that transfer portal opens up and this historic class, if it is still down there in College Station, because I think the vast majority of those players are not going to be there come January. So then, what do you have to build around? Uh, they need to pull the cord, and they need to have done it, like I said, three, four weeks ago. But uh, I don't know if they've got the guts to do it. Get a get a qualified coach down there in Texas A&M, uh, with Alabama descending. Call it what it is. I mean, they they may win another SEC or two. They may win a national championship or two. But I don't know. Get, uh, Nick Saban does not seem completely comfortable with his NIL with his transfer portal. This was supposed to be Alabama's year. Here they are with two losses. I I just don't see that he's going to be there for in Tuscaloosa much longer. So, okay. <laughs> It's one thing to write Jimbo Fisher off. You just pretty much signaled you think Nick Saban is is, short, is a short timer. What? I'm not. I realize you don't know the answer to my next question, but how much longer? What does that mean? I mean, do you think that's this year, next year, a relatively short period? Well, I mean, I think it could come as soon as this offseason, Paul. We'll see what Bryce Young decides to do, but you got to believe he's going to jump to the NFL. And he's been carrying that team for two seasons now. Uh, Nick Saban seems to have struck out on both these coordinator hires. Everybody wants to point the, the finger at these coordinators, but he's the one picking them last time I checked. And it's the offense that's been carrying Alabama for about five or six seasons now. I've been saying it for – people think I'm crazy, Paul, but you go back and look at some of these big-time matchups – Alabama has had in recent years where they're facing a competent offense with a good quarterback, they can't slow them down. Now, that is a product of college football opening up a little bit more. I get that. But at the same time, where is this dominant defense that Nick Saban built this program on? I'm, I see it at Georgia with Kirby Smart. So you can't tell me they can't field a, an elite defense there in Alabama. The numbers look good, sure. But again, not when they play Tennessee. Not when they play A&M, which can't win a ball game. I mean, they were a two-point conversion away from getting it done. LSU, which, great team, I get it, but not on the level of Alabama, and they got it done. Ole Miss, I don't know how many players Nick Saban would take off that Ole Miss roster over the players on his roster, yet they nearly lost that one. Texas, we can go on and on and on. This is, this is not one season, Paul. This is multiple seasons, and I, do, I just don't know how comfortable Nick Saban is in this new climate of, of college football. Well, he certainly doesn't seem comfortable. He, he doesn't even use the word NIL, Michael. He always refers to it as name, image, and likeness, as if he just wants to spit it out. Uh, and, and, but, but he stuck with it, as we all know. Uh, what do you think would go into that deci decision? Uh, you know, obviously, everybody wants to go out on top. He's probably not going. He certainly couldn't go out on top this year unless you uh, call you know, winning some uh, – New Year's Day bowl game a big deal, which doesn't seem to be anymore. Uh, how does he determine that? Well, I think we'll, it'll determine itself this offseason, Paul, if he does come back, which, you know, he likely will, but we'll see with, again, when the portal opens up in early December, will Alabama chase some of the biggest names? Alabama can outpay anybody, so we'll see if they do it. They could have Jordan Addison right now if they wanted to open the checkbook, and maybe that solves a lot of the issues they have on that offense right now. They don't have a big-time playmaker at the, the receiver position. I know they got some touted quarterbacks on the roster now, but if – I, I certainly don't think Caleb Williams is going to jump in the portal again, but maybe a name similar to that. Does Alabama pursue that? Does Alabama push all their chips in in the free agency of college football to make another run at it to to finally topple Georgia? Now the flip that script, the, the script that's flipped here, Paul. Now we're saying can Alabama ever get over this Georgia hump again? I just don't see it the way Kirby Smart's recruiting and his players are, are, are playing at such a high level. 
So just to make it clear, Michael, and I, I heard it clearly, but I want to make sure the audience heard it clearly. You really, at this point in time, don't believe that Nick Saban's going to be able to topple Kirby Smart. Am I hearing you correctly? That's absolutely correct, Paul. I mean, and no disrespect to Stetson Bennett. He's, he's a fine player. Anytime we criticize him, we, I got to hear from it from people in Athens. But there's a reason they went after Caleb Williams in the transfer portal last uh, offseason. Imagine Georgia with a big-time quarterback, just how better that program can even be. than They may win back-to-back -back national championships here, Paul, with a walk-on quarterback. Imagine if they have uh, the next Caleb Williams on that roster. How, how is anybody going to slow them down? Well, certainly they're going, to, they're going to be replacing a quarterback. And Nick Saban's had to replace Jalen Hurts with uh, Tua, Mac Jones, and Bryce Young will be heading to the draft here very shortly. Uh, and it, it is a real dilemma. Michael, never, you never disappoint. Thank you very much for your time. We will see you soon. Count on it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Paul. Michael Bratton from That SEC Podcast. Uh, he does not leave you uh, disappointed. Uh, we will take a break. Well, it may leave you disappointed, but he doesn't, he doesn't leave you hungry. We'll take a break. More to come right after this.